What's going on, everyone? James Hancock here. Just caught the season finale to season seven of Game of Thrones, an episode called The Dragon and the Wolf. While the cliffhanger ending is probably something pretty much every fan anticipated, it was still an absolute joy to get to that point. At last, the chessboard is fully in place. The Night King and his armies are heading south. The majority of the living are unified and heading north. And whatever happens in season eight, I think I've heard that it's seven two-hour episodes, but I imagine we're going to see some epic combat. But I imagine it'll be a hell of a lot more than just battle, 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 because that would be very expensive, but also very repetitive and very boring. And it seems like Cersei's snake-like deceptive demeanor is probably going to lead to some massive double cross, perhaps even taking sides with the Night King. I, I doubt she'll go that far. I mean, Cersei might be power mad, but I think in the end she is on the side of the living and breathing, particularly her bun in the oven that is going to be coming our way in the very near future. But at last with this episode, we get what has been meant all along by George R. R. Martin calling his series A Song of Ice and Fire. A lot of people have predicted for years that that basically could be interpreted as a song of both Jon Snow and Daenerys Targaryen. And we see they finally got together on a very romantic boat ride back to the north. I mean, there's a scene after this giant meeting where they talk about the best way to get all the armies north. And when Jon suggests a boat ride where she join them and she accepted his invitation, I was like, oh, they're totally going to bone. And sure enough, <laughs> like the first night, he goes through a door with a very intense smoldering look in his eyes to go inside. And it's actually a very... I wouldn't say it was like a hot scene, but it was a nice, moving, romantic sex scene. They seemed to have some really intense feelings for each other in their gazes. So it was a, it was a very, very sexy scene, but not like, like, like a hot scene. But of course, as I've been saying all along, in true Targaryen fashion, in the Targaryen family, it is not entirely uncommon to marry cousins, sisters, aunts, etc. Or the reverse, you know, brothers, uncles, etc. And Daenerys is technically Jon's aunt. They're not very far apart in age, but her older brother is his dad. So whether or not that'll be an issue in season eight, and when and where and how Bran and Sam might choose to tell Jon, who can say? But we finally know that Jon is the true direct heir to the Iron Throne, but it seems as if there'd be no problem whatsoever for him and Danny to sit side by side. And it seems as if, in battle at least, they're going to be riding into battle side by side against the Night King. I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I do want to go through the episode from start to finish, but all around, very, very cool episode. In a weird way, throughout all seven seasons, the last episode is always my favorite, in spite of the fact that the last episode very rarely has any major action set pieces. But what I like about these final episodes of every season is how... It re is, this is where like the major dialogue takes place that sets the stage for the action to come. The betrayals, the alliances, this is where like the real meat of the drama takes place. And if you're looking for meaty drama, it's hard to find a better scene than the one that took place between Cersei Lannister and Tyrion Lannister as they basically go over all the heartache and all the murder and all the mayhem that has taken place between them within their own family for many, many years. But before I get to the official recap, I just say season seven was absolutely epic, an absolute blast. Perhaps some could argue that the plot is less intricate and that the plot is less sophisticated ever since the show became basically just a pure TV show that's doing its own thing outside of the books. But that's totally fine because it seems like the audience is there for it. The audience is eating it up. And for people who've been reading these books for over 20 years and just want to see how this fucking story ends, it's very, very satisfying to have a lot of momentum and a lot of seismic change to the status quo. While I still eagerly look forward to the publication of The Winds of Winter, which I know will be wildly different from what we have seen in season six and seven, I'm just enjoying the show on its own merits. And when it comes to medieval fantasy with a supernatural element and a lot of adult themes, including a lot of sex and violence, chalk me up as an extremely satisfied fan. So let's dig into the meat of the episode and what actually went down one of my favorite parts was just seeing Bronn and Jamie watching as the Unsullied and the Dothraki Screamers arrive at the walls of King's Landing. You see just how awe-inspiring and intimidating Daenerys' army is, but I love how Bronn boils it all down to very simple terms like, man, it's a, an army of people without cocks. What's left to fight for? And Jamie says, well, you can fight for gold. And he's like, yeah, well, I've known guys who are in wars and battles my entire life, and 
What do you think all their money goes toward? The obvious answer is that these people are fighting for freedom and their belief in Daenerys Targaryen, or at least when it comes to the Dothraki screamers, they're fighting for conquest. But I just, I always love Bronn, and I love how he jokes, jokes about how he enjoys being called my lord. But what's really fun about this episode is that it brings pretty much every single character we know and love pretty much all to the precise same location as everybody converges on King's Landing to have this massive strategy session trying to find a way to declare truce so that they can deal with the, the, with the true threat from the North. As John says, there's only one war that matters, the Great War. And what's interesting is this scene provides an opportunity for a lot of reunions for characters who have not seen each other in several seasons. I mean, it's great to see Tyrion and Pod hanging out. I mean, they used to get along so well. I mean, Tyrion and Bronn and Pod used to all hang out and talk about Pod's magic cock. And it was great to see Pod and Bronn walk off for a drink. It was interesting seeing Brienne and the Hound talk, because Brienne and the Hound obviously fought nearly to the death last time, but they both really love and care for Arya, and Brienne brings them up to speed on what Arya's been up to. We see the Hound and the Mountain reuniting after a very, very long time, and of course, the Mountain's in not so good shape these days, where he's just this giant walking zombie of death and poison. And something tells me, before it's all said and done, the Hound and the Mountain are going to have a reckoning, especially since we all know that uh, Cersei is not entirely loyal to this giant war in the North. It will provide an opportunity, perhaps, for the Hound and the Mountain to fuck each other up, which is something I've been looking forward to since I read the very first book, way back in like 2009 or what number it was that I actually discovered this series. But what I loved about the giant meeting, first and foremost, it takes place in an environment where the Targaryens used to keep all their dragons essentially in a giant cage. And it's what led to the dragons going extinct. Dragons need to be able to roam and eat and feed and fly. And if you keep them in a cage, essentially, they just waste away, which is exactly what happened. Daenerys makes this great dramatic entrance flying in on her dragon. And Tyrion... I feel like this is kind of Tyrion's moment that he's been waiting for his entire career in this story. Tyrion probably knows the history and the politics of this world better than anybody. And he basically just brings everybody up to speed about how there's been no shortage of betrayal and murder and mayhem. Like everybody's got their grievances. Everybody's lost loved ones. Everybody's suffered. And that everybody's just going to have to get over it and join forces and look past all their differences because what unites them is... The fight for survival. No matter what their grievances might be, they all pale in comparison to the complete and total destruction of every living thing on Westeros, or perhaps even the world, if the army were to continue to press onward beyond Westeros. And he just really lays a bear how everybody needs, needs to set aside all their petty bullshit. We have a great dramatic moment as the Hound releases the undead soldier who immediately makes a beeline for Cersei. And as they chop them up into a million little pieces, all the pieces keep moving. John demonstrates how they can be burned or killed by dragon glass. And Kyburn, of course, is very, very fascinating. It seems like nobody's more interested in the powers of the undead who's in that present company than Kyburn. I mean, that's obviously right up his alley when it comes to his specific interests. Euron pretends that he is going to just get all the ironborn and go back to the Iron Islands and because the undead can't swim. But as we learn later in the episode, it's actually all part of an elaborate ruse that he's actually going to sail to Essos and pick up these 20,000 soldiers called the Golden Company. Now, the Golden Company figure very prominently in Book 5 five of George R. R. Martin's series. We get a lot of uh, detailed information about them, but they've never lost a battle and they've never broken a contract. And they're just, it's 20,000 total battle, like the best mercenaries in the world. And in the book, they're actually in service of a character that's not even in the show, uh, a relative of Daenerys's who has an even stronger claim to the throne than she has. And it's one of the, one of the areas where the books and the show really have split, but it is cool that the Golden Company at least is going to be incorporated into season eight. Long story short, Cersei says she will accept the truce on the condition that Jon remains in the north. Jon says he can only serve one queen and that he's already pledged his allegiance to Daenerys Targaryen. Cersei says the truce is off. Tyrion has a long sit down with her where they talk about all the reasons why they hate each other and all the, you know, their lifelong feud. And both of them are obviously feel totally justified. But in the end, Tyrion at least appears to be successful in getting Cersei to pledge her allegiance. Of course, we learn at the end of the episode, Cersei doesn't give a fuck about the cause and actually finally breaks ranks with Jaime. Jaime rides off with no army, no wealth, no anything to join the fight in the north. 
And for a brief shining moment, it looked as if Cersei were going to use the mountain to keep Jaime at her side, but Jaime calls her bluff and strides on out. So I was very, very excited to see Jaime break ranks with Cersei because Jaime's one of those characters that have always been fascinating. Even when I read the first book and I thought he was a total villain, I mean, he was just, everyone called him the Kingslayer, but I've always found him very charming, very interesting. I love the fact that he's a total badass warrior who's deprived of his greatest weapon. And how he's basically, his entire saga or arc's been about searching for an identity or a sense of redemption beyond just being the mere Kingslayer. And it looks as if he's finally going to have an opportunity to prove himself. Another weird thing I noticed while watching this episode is just how quickly I've gotten used to seeing John, Daenerys, and Tyrion side by side. Ever since I first started reading the books, they've been my three favorite characters. And for years and years and years, all I've wanted is to see them all on the same side, interacting, helping and supporting one another. And now we're a few episodes in where they've been working together. And it's like, I keep forgetting, like, oh, I need to appreciate the fact that they're all on the same screen at the same time. Because we've just been waiting years and years. But here they are just talking and interacting. And it's just fantastic, wonderful stuff. We get some stuff with Theon in this Part of it which was really interesting, part of it which was a little less so, but Theon and John basically talk about doing the right thing, keeping one's word, and about the influence of their dead father figure. I mean, obviously John is at least known as his bastard, and Theon was one of his wards when he was there in captivity. But John basically says, look, I can't forgive you for everything, but you are a Greyjoy and you're a Stark. And they should both try to live in a way that would make Eddard Stark proud. Theon decides the best thing he can do is try to free his sister from his fucked up uncle. And he has, it was, it was, I guess they just felt like they needed to have some action of some kind in this episode. So he goes down and basically fights a guy to regain the loyalty of some of his men and prove he's not a coward. And there's this little bit when the guy's kneeing him in the nuts. And of course, Theon has no equipment downstairs, so that doesn't work. And Theon ends up winning the fight. In any case, I understand why they felt like they needed to throw some action in, but... Perhaps that scene might have been the weakest in the episode, just for my own particular taste. And what I really loved about this episode is that they found a way to make my least favorite plot line of this season into something really, really interesting. I kept feeling as if in the previous episodes that Littlefinger's attempts to turn Arya and Sansa against one another was a little forced and a little manufactured. I just wasn't buying it. But thankfully, they really stick the landing with this incredible scene where Littlefinger believes that Arya is being brought before Sansa to be tried for treason and murder. And it turns out it's actually a trial for Littlefinger for his treason and his murder because going back since before the show and the books even began, he was the one who was instrumental in Jon Arryn being poisoned. He was the one who was instrumental and basically instigating and starting the war between the Starks and the Lannisters. The, the, battle, the War of the Five Kings would have never happened if Littlefinger hadn't been manipulating everybody. Bran is able to confirm that Littlefinger actually held the knife to Ned's throat and said, I warned you not to trust me. And they call him out on the fact that he set up Tyrion for the attempted murder of Bran when it was actually Littlefinger's knife all along. Arya steps forward, slashes his throat, Littlefinger's done. I always wondered what Littlefinger's final... Th- fate might be. I wondered how much, just how much power he would accumulate. I never in a million years thought that he, that the story would end well for him. And yeah, sure enough, it was just great to see Bran, Arya, and Sansa, three Stark children in Winterfell, behaving in a fashion that would make their father proud. It's just great to see the Starks reunited with common cause, taking care of business, because most of the story prior to the season was about watching the Starks scatter to the four winds and enduring all sorts of horrible hardships. And now they're finally taking charge of their own destinies again. I know I keep saying this, but another thing that I loved about this episode was seeing Sam return to Winterfell and teaming up with Bran. Obviously, Sam is a man of the mind, and so is Bran. And it's great to see them in Winterfell working together. And they have a conversation about Jon's parentage. And between what Sam learned from Rhaegar's annulment and his subsequent marriage to Lyanna. And Bran basically looks back in time to confirm it, but they finally realize that Jon is, in fact, Aegon Targaryen, named after his great ancestor who first conquered and unified the Seven Kingdoms. Granted, he didn't conquer all of them. He conquered six of them, and he had a truce with Dorne. But obviously, Aegon was the one who started the Targaryen era in the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. So it's cool that Jon's real name comes from such a powerful, badass ancestor. But I feel like with Sam and Bran working together, the army of the living is going to have some very great intelligence and some great strategists. As much as you need guys like Tormund and Jaime and the Hound and like badass guys who can fuck people up, you also need the really, really smart people who read all the books or can look into the past. And so I feel like Bran and Sam are going to be an awesome team. And of course, we get the final major cliffhanger. And what was great about the cliffhanger is that it was shot in such an epic, beautiful fashion. I mean, this season, I think it's had the best photography of any of them by far. And we get this killer, beautiful shot of the wall and Eastwatch in the ocean. 
as the camera lifts up and over the wall and we see Tormund and Beric Dondarrion kind of patrolling the grounds and looking down. The army of the dead emerges slowly from the trees. They look creepy as fuck. You see the giants, you see the men. And of course the Night King comes roaring in on his newly acquired dragon and with blue dragon fire just lays the wall low, opening up for this giant advance into the lands of Westeros beyond the wall. The Great War is here. All the pieces are in play. The only thing missing is book six of George R. R. Martin's series. And then whether that will ever get a book seven, who the hell knows? But at the very least, we know we'll be getting season eight. And I think what I heard was that it's going to be sometime in like the winter of 2019. So we got about probably a little less than a year and a half to wait. That's totally fine. It gives George R. R. Martin a chance to get caught up a little bit. So hope everyone enjoyed the season. Thank you so much for watching my reviews and recaps. I really appreciate it. Please consider giving my channel a subscribe. As the fall television season begins, I'll be looking for more things to watch. I'm definitely going to be following Star Trek, but it, and I'll probably be watching Peaky Blinders. But if anybody has any recommendations for great fall TV shows, definitely send them my way. I would really, really appreciate it. But thanks so much for watching. Talk to you all soon.